the great philosopher and theorist Erica Edwards argues that literature is a repository for what she calls counter stories, a dialogic site for reimagining possibilities. In my new book, Animating Black and Brown Liberation, A Theory of American Literatures, it also explores this ideal about what words, what literature can actually do in this type of very troubling context. It asks, can novels and plays and at times poetry feature, featuring activists as protagonists? Uh, can these fictitious narratives inform current day activists on the front line and give insight and direction and inspiration to help activists become more productive and more effective uh, in their work? The book also seeks to reevaluate what it means to write great literature. In my particular field of literature, uh, historically, in order for a book to be great or thought to be one of the great books, it had to have several characteristics. Among them, it had to be universal. It had to be able to appeal to a universal audience, or so it was said. And so when authors who are African American, for example, uh, would write about protest, about injustice, about violence against the black body, at times the critics of the day would place that work in a very, very small box and call it protest literature. It wasn't respected as high art. It wasn't universal, they claimed, because it was too parochial. Its concerns too narrow to fit into the broad scope of that which was universal. And as a result, it was denigrated as being, again, so-called uh, protest literature. But as we know, for those of us who travel, in most subpopulations around the world, someone is facing injustice. Is that not correct? Sure. You may go to uh, Spain. If you've been to Spain, for example, you may encounter the Romani people, the so-called gypsies who are experiencing suffering and oppression there. Or if you're an American woman in, in, in a domestic situation that is unsafe and unhealthy, that could be a type of oppression. If you're black in LA, certainly that can be a type of oppression. And so certainly justice, or rather injustice, is actually quite universal itself. And consequently, the fight against uh, injustice, the fight for freedom, is also universal uh, as well. And so I'm arguing in this book that as opposed to denigrating work that talks about injustice or saying that it's too parochial, no, we should instead be thinking about if you're a critic of literature, you should, you should be able to uh, discern a book's value by at least considering how people, how the characters, how those beings in these novels and plays and at times poetry are responding to injustice, are responding to uh, the gaze of those who are, who are hegemons trying to delimit their particular uh, world and life art. That should be how we consider and think about uh, literature, at least in part when, when adjudicating the, the value of a piece of literature. And so the book seeks to, uh, to, to invert uh, the paradigm and offer a new technology in which to think about literature. And so the book we uh, read, work by Ishmael Reed, uh, Tony Bambara, these are all kind of activist narratives. Uh, uh, Placentia, June Jordan, Kamal Daoud, and a series of other great uh, writers. The book also argues that literature uh, is an actant. Actant is a notion by the great French philosopher Bruno Latour who says that an actant is a human or non-human source of action. It has efficacy. It can do things. It can alter the course of events. And the book argue, argues that in this present historical moment, uh, given the course uh, of the arc of our current day, we need people who are actants to come and do the good work of the people. As my good friend uh, D. Black says, who's now dead, he uh, had a heart condition, he passed away unexpectedly a number of years ago. He said that life is short and death is certain. And his short life bore that truth out for his friends and his family, his daughter. And so the call to action is now, as he would say, because life is short uh, and death is certain. But as we know, there are many barriers to taking action to help other people, because our own lives can be quite complicated. Our own lives can be uh, enveloped in, in change and in challenge. But it is during those times when you are facing your own dilemmas, when your own life is challenged, that is the best time to be of service. To take our minds off of ourselves and give service to others, even when our own lives are immersed in incredible transition incredible challenge and incredible disappointment. Because in those moments when you give to others, you recognize that your own suffering is not simply your own. You are a part of a larger framework of people living 
the human uh, condition in a way that unites all of us because everyone has some type of difficulty, some type of a challenge. And so the barriers of, of, of taking action are real but can be surmounted. And then secondly, in our modern historical context, especially culturally, with the impact of social media and other types of, of social frameworks that we live in, uh, live in and under today, there, there is a, a, a meanness that uh, percolates in our society. Because folks can hide behind a meme or hide behind a screen name or hide behind uh, a, a, a false identity and begin to lash out. But more so, and increasingly so, we see people uh, moving beyond that screen and in, in public, in the public discourse, being mean uh, when they could choose to be at least reasonable or rational. From the very top of our government to the people who may work with us in our departments or may sit next to us in our classes or at times people in our own families. Trolling, online bullying, or just being mean-spirited. Who knows at least one person like who could choose to be nice but does not choose to be nice. Just raise your hand. Who knows at least one? Yes, probably most of us. Well, I know someone like that. I'm a part of a, a writing workshop in Los Angeles, which is a very powerful place. The people are, are, are very committed to writing excellent art in this, in this workshop. And there's a woman, one of our members, you know, we embrace everyone. We don't uh, say because you're not nice, you can't come. But we embrace everyone in the workshop. But this woman, you know, she is, she likes to dig at people to find a way just to be mean-spirited. That's just what she does, that's her thing. She likes to just dig and then twist. Dig, twist. That could be a dance. Dig it, just twist it. It'd be a bad dance though. So she left for some reason for four or five months uh, and then she came back. And so one day I happened to come in the workshop and she was there. And we haven't seen each other in probably four or five months. And as opposed to saying, wow, Michael, it was good to see you. I uh, miss you, how's it been going, how's the writing going, how's the fam doing? Uh, she could have said, uh, man, you know, any new books coming out, what's happening in literature? But she did not say those things upon first seeing me in a very crowded writing workshop. Not to, to offer a little context to this, this interaction. Now when she was gone, it just so happened that uh, about a block from our workshop, a new, uh, a new business opened uh, called Krispy Kreme. You guys know this, this place? They make donuts. And so in, our, in, in LA, everything is big and better. So we have, we, have, we have the Krispy Kreme donut factory of donut factories. There's like a big glass window. It's in the corner of Crenshaw Boulevard, which is like the black mecca of LA, and King Boulevard. It's got a big glass pitcher window where you see the donuts on the little the conveyor belt just getting greased and oiled and sugared up you know, around the bend. You know? And so as you drive your car down Crenshaw, you, you, you're, just, you're, you're transfixed by donuts getting sugared up. So uh, to offer some context, it is true that in my walking and driving past this Krispy Kreme organization, this donut factory, I made several stops over the course of those four or five months. <laughs> and I did, it is true, I gained about 20, 25 pounds, uh, due mostly to Krispy Kreme, I have to say. And so when this woman, who's a part of our workshop, sees me, she does not say, Michael, you know, how about, how about those Lakers? She says instead, so I come in, she's right there, she says, what you been eating? <laughs> that is a true story. And it was actually very hurtful. We were in public, she had such a, a look of wow on her face. To offer a little more context, now she is not a small person herself. And I am sure she made several trips her own self to uh, Krispy Kreme. I'm just saying, that was her response to seeing her colleague after four or five months. And so in that context, and she's an extreme example, I hope, but oftentimes in the, in the context where people are feeling emboldened to be mean-spirited, it has a way of truncating our own experience. Uh, we are less inclined to put ourselves, quote unquote, out there in the public sphere for fear of being attacked, right? It's harder to be our most authentic selves because we may think that someone may a, a may attack us, belittle us, tease us, or worse, not really, really like us. And that can be a very, very damaging thing. Because when you cannot be your most authentic self, it's very difficult to be your most full and uh, replete self. I, I find this in particular to be a problem for folks who are Gen Z, folks who are students in college today, I'm a professor and I'm around lots of folks who are 18 to 25. 
And I find that my students oftentimes um, have a difficult time being themselves for fear of being judged too critically for not getting sufficient likes, not just in terms of online presence, but likes in their everyday face-to-face -face lives. But that fear of attack, that fear of uh, not being embraced, or that fear of not being liked by others um, has a way of propping up and, and stopping us from being our most authentic selves even at a time when we need to be our most authentic selves, like when, someone else, like when someone around us needs our help or needs us to stand up for them and defend them because they're being bullied in our presence or, or they're being treated in a way that we know is not correct, but we refuse to stand up, although our authentic self says, hey, say something, do something, stop this, be involved, be engaged, we don't do it because we're afraid of being the person who uh, may also be a, a victim of attack or ridicule. It reminds me of a time when I was a young boy, about 10 or 11, I was living in Long Beach, California. I played basketball from a very early age. In my neighborhood, it was, was a pretty rough situation. We had a, it was ran, kind of controlled by a gang called the Insane Crips. And when your nickname is Insane, that's going to be bad just overall, right? So in our neighborhood, we just had, we had, literally we had three white kids in our whole neighborhood school at Lincoln Elementary School, and one kid's name was Bobby. Bobby was a great athlete. He played ball with us all the time. Um, he wasn't really a friend, but I knew Bobby. He was fine. So Bobby left for a while. About, I think he moved to a different school, but he came back to our local park one day. So I was playing ball with my friends in the park, a park called Cal Rec. We were all playing ball, and then I saw Bobby, because it was rare to see white kids walking down the park in our neighborhood, and I was going to run over, I was running over to the fence to call him over to say, hey, Bobby, because he was a great ball player, come and join us. And in that moment, these two teenage Crips, who were probably like 16 or 17, were on bikes. They rolled right into the park, and they just hit Bobby right in the jaw. We were like 10 or 11. And he just went down. And they began to, right there in the park, they were kicking him, stomping him. And the guys who I was playing ball with ran to the fence next to me, and I was trying to say, I was going to say, I, I know him, no. They ran next to me and said, beat that white boy, stomp him, kick him, stomp him, beat him. And in that moment, I just froze. I didn't yell for help. I didn't say, I know this kid, he's a cool kid. I didn't say, stop, please stop. Thank God, a, a grown man in his car who was driving down the street jumped out of his moving car, like door open, Thornton Park, and ran in the park and threatened these young boys and got them off of Bobby and then walked him. Bobby was, he was totally bloody, walked him out of the park right by me. I, I said nothing. I was too afraid to break that color line. I didn't want to be the one who said, don't beat the white kid up. I was afraid um, to be my most authentic self. Although I knew it was wrong, I knew this kid, he was a great kid, a great ball player, but he was victimized and I could say nothing, I chose to do nothing to help him. And that moment really impacted me. It really, even today thinking about it, makes me uh, feel shame and embarrassment. What it did do though, because it bothered me so much, although I was only 10 or 11 at the time, I determined to never have that feeling again. I'd rather get beat up than have someone like that beat up in front of me, a guy I knew especially. And so at times, our desire for safety, our desire to be liked, uh, our desire to not be different will stop us from even doing that which we know we need to do. There is such great power, you guys, in authenticity. Uh, by show of hands, who just loves fake ass people? Just raise your hand. You just love fake ass people. Listen, no one loves fake ass people. We love people who will tell us the truth, who will be authentic with us um, in our personal relationships with them uh, as well. Who would rather at times, though, have someone tell you a hard truth or maybe fudge and, and lie a little at times? Who would say, I'd rather be told a hard truth, who would say, well, sometimes a little lie is not so bad. At times, it kind of depends, right? It kind of depends. And these en encounters between being told someone's authentic truth or lie happen oftentimes in, in intimate relationships, in romantic uh, encounters with folks you may like, who's a classmate or a colleague or someone you meet in some social setting. There was a young woman when I was uh, 
because we don't want to be rejected. Of course, we don't want um, to at times express our true feelings uh, because we're afraid of being seen as weird, certainly on a college campus. Um, in, in the hookup culture of many colleges, even couples don't hold hands. Even a boyfriend and girlfriend or a girlfriend and girlfriend are, 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 are disinclined to hold hands or, or show too much PDA or, or even be together for fear of being thought you know, a little bit too weird. And it, it's, it's frightening to have that level of vulnerability in the public sphere. When I was an undergrad, I went to school at, at Berkeley as an undergrad. We had a woman, a young woman, a student named Ruth. She had won this really major national poetry prize while she was in college. She had a book out in college. And she was beautiful. Like, not like super pretty. I mean, like, beautiful. And worse, she had this voice that sounded like butter dripping off one of Jean's st high stacks of pancakes, really slow, like this. And when she would speak, she's from, from New York, super brilliant woman. She would say things like this. It, you, it would be anything, it would sound good. I'd love to cut your throat and feed you to all the wolves in the world. And you'd be like, that's a great idea. It's great. So many of the poets had a crush on her for good reason. So I was in her, I was in one of her uh, seminars, a, a poetry seminar, with the great poet June Jordan, who was our, who was our, men, our mentor, as well as our professor. And uh, we had an assignment one day to write a poem about nature, right? So we had to write some poem about nature, and then we had to, in the workshop seminar, we had to all read our poem eventually in the workshops, in the workshop seminar that, that semester. And so I was writing my poem, but in the moment, just the impact of Ruth really moved me. So my piece was really about her. It was, it was a nature poem, but it was about her being in nature. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to actually write a poem about Ruth for class. That'll, that'll be my assignment. So the day it was, it was my time, time to actually read my poem, I thought, I am going to read my poem in public, in my seminar, to a fellow student. Just try to imagine right now, student, who, who's, a, who's a student right now? Raise your hand, students. Imagine this semester of last year, one of your classes or one of your seminars, you're writing a poem to one of your, your, your colleagues in class. Just think about this situation here. So they call my name, I stand up, Ruth is sitting like right there. And I begin to read this poem called Ruth, subtitled for a fellow poet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and people got super like, <gasps> and so in the poem, it's talking about how Ruth is a very powerful woman, you know, and in the poem, the narrative of the poem, there's this fall, and, and there's this one tree, and there's one leaf that was resisting death. I am not gonna fall and fall, but then Ruth begins to walk by in this poem, and Ruth walks by, and against its will, this leaf just leaps to death. In that part of the poem, I actually put lyrics from an old Commodore song. I, I, I can't even hold a note. I'm tone deaf. But in class, in front of everyone, I say, and the lone leaf leaped to death. And I walked towards Ruth in class, and I said, just to be close <laughs> to you, girl. <laughs> right in class. And, and, and the poem ends like that. My hand is out. The poem is over. And in my mind, I envisioned her saying beforehand, uh, oh my God, Michael, I, I feel the same way. How did you know? How could you have known I've been so close to the best with my feelings towards you? How did you know I felt this way? I love your boldness and your, and your, and your grown manness. Thank you for going for in front of all of these people. Thank you. Give me a hug. In my mind, I saw all of that. So I'm, I'm like this. She's right there. I'm like this. And then she doesn't say anything. And then her head does this. And I was like, oh my God. And I thought, what am I going to do with my hand right now? <laughs> For about five long seconds, I was like this. And then finally our professor said, so Michael, what are you trying to say? And then everyone laughed and I went back to my chair completely humiliated. Right? 
So although I got kicked to the curb and was deep in the friend zone forever, even today, um, we're still colleagues and friends, um, in that moment afterwards, it was very empowering because I actually felt those feelings. I felt like that leaf falling when she walked past me every day in class. You know, although I cannot sing, in my soul I was singing to Ruth every day in class. And it gave me a sense of understanding about the power of being vulnerable. Although it was a horrible experience to be that raw, to be that just, I mean, I was out, I, was, I sang guys in class and I do not sing. Think about that, it was, it was pretty bad, pretty bad, pretty bad, pretty scarring actually, but uh, still working through that pain. But in that moment, I learned about the power of radical vulnerability. I knew and I loved, I loved myself more for having that experience. And as the Buddhists say, I, I had my heart broken wide open. And in that, broken, in that brokenness, I came to know my humanness more. And it really undergirded me as a human being in that, in that moment. It gave me power. And that is the power of authenticity, right? At your most authentic point, when you are vulnerable, that authenticity and the vulnerability combine to give you an actual kind of palpable power that I cannot uh, over-exaggerate. It also manifests, of course, in writing, in books, when the books are, are well-written and there's a great narrative behind it, for example. Who's ever read a memoir, maybe, or a novel where the writing with a story is so raw uh, and so vulnerable that you actually have a physical reaction. Maybe you cry, maybe you're like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Raise your hand. Who's ever had that experience? Just, just give me the name of the book. What's your name? Ben. Yeah, ben, what's the name of the book? Uh, yes, it's great. What else? What, what's your name in the back? Yes, you? Yes. What is your book? Um, yes, me too. So that book actually changed my entire life. I was in a total corporate, when I was undergrad, a corporate, a cor I was a, from a poor family, I had done this whole corporate business thing. I took, as a total lark, I took a, a lit course with a Barbara Christian at Cal, and that was the first book I read. And I was so blown away. I mean, I was, that book literally changed my entire life. And I called my mother that semester, like week 10, and I said, Mom, there's been a change in the master plan. I'm not going to be some corporate raider. I'm going to be a poet. In a, she's like, she began to curse it, but that was also a bad story. But thanks for saying that. The bluest eye. Right, such a raw and beautiful book. When you can have those types of, of book-tethered experiences, you know the power of writing and the power of artists. You know, the great writer and activist James Baldwin argued that uh, writers, artists, really all artists, are uniquely qualified to be great activists because, like being vulnerable, you, you can't be vulnerable and be safe. And Baldwin said that, that artists are uniquely uh, qualified to be activists because they're willing to risk safety to do what is right. In fact, he said that artists, quote, artists are here to prove and make one bear that all safety is an illusion. It's our job to make one bear that all safety is an illusion. It is in our desire to be safe that we stop becoming and being and living out our most authentic self. It is in our desire to be safe that we don't help our colleague who's being beat down because he is white. It is in our desire to be safe that we let loves of our lives walk out of our lives, or our desire to be safe that when challenge comes, we retreat into ourselves and not go and help those who also are in need around us. He says that, Baldwin says that, it is this, this struggle with safety and humanness that is a lifelong struggle for all of us. And it's so important to be engaged in this struggle if you are an artist. He says, quote, that the artist's struggle must be considered as a metaphor for the struggle that is universal and daily for all human beings on the face of this terrifying globe to get to become human beings. The poets, by which I mean all artists, are the only ones who know the truth about us, end quote. By a show of hands, who does some art? 
But we know that Zach and Don play great music. Who does art? Hands up. That's right. Maybe you write, you do poetry. Listen, we know the truth about us, uh, about the human experience. I mean, listening to Don and, and Zach play, I was so moved hearing those Coltrane tunes and hearing that improvisation and hearing the power of the breath on display uh, as it filled this room, reminding me again of the power that artists have. Uh, but artists have got to put the, the art into action. It has to be an active. It has to have efficacy and get things done, do things, alter the course um, of events. It's critical for artists, even during times of struggle and change and challenge, when our schools are closing, and we're forced to make a different life course. It is in those moments where we, 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 we turn to our art and we write about it and we sing about it and we cry about it and we connect through our art because that's what we do when we express the human condition as artists. We put the art into practice. Of course, the irony of this is that during uh, times of economic struggle, at least in California, it, when the school budgets are tight, they almost always cut out the art programs, which makes no sense. Because art is about creativity. You, you are a creator. And if you know anything about life at all, you know that everyone has problems. I got a gang of them, let me tell you. Right? But so does every organization, every nonprofit, every for profit. So those who are most successful in leadership, who are in charge of things, are almost always great at problem solving, at creative problem solving. And so it makes sense to me, at least, that we should not be trying to cut the arts but put more money into the arts because it helps you become and address issues more creatively. That's just, you know, make me the mayor guys of the world and just roll with me, okay? It'll be better. And so, you know, I imagine artists as, um, as both activists and also healers. And as a result, we have to do a better job at self-care. When I was at Berkeley, I knew a, a bunch of like super dynamic people, a lot of incredible artists. We were in the middle of uh, various movements back then when I was an undergrad. But one after one, these men and women began to just burn the hell out. You know, they were working full-time jobs, organizing the community, being in relationships, getting married, getting divorced, having kids, drinking, drugging, activating, you know, activizing, organizing, and they began to burn out and, and began to get bitter, mad at the folks who they, were, who they were actually organizing. And too often, the organizers who I know seemed to like dislike the folks that they were helping to organize in our neighborhoods back, uh, back in the Bay at the time. So I learned firsthand about the import of um, self-care for men in particular, because many of the men don't do, do such a great job at processing our pain. You know, we tend, at least in my experience, among my female colleagues who are activists and artists and professors, uh, my colleagues, when they have a pro problem, they tend to, who are women, they tend to cycle down, they'll call a friend, They'll read a book, self-help book, they'll eat some chocolate, they'll buy some red bottom shoes, whatever, they'll buy a purse. These, these are my friends. My male friends who are activists and scholars and professors and people in my world, when we go down, we will pretend that we're okay, go to the bar or smoke weed all day for about a week, and then reimburse them. I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, right? And they do this. So my female friends do this. They, they go down, they cycle down and they come up somehow just better, wiser, just stronger. My male friends do this, right? Uh, these are my female colleagues. So they're up here now, and we're way down here, dragging, right? So I'm concerned because that imbalance is a problem. You know, too often, um, in my experience, anyway, the men are not handling their business effectively because they're not taking care of themselves in a way that I think uh, is healthy, and that includes me, at least a part, for a part uh, of my life, so self-care is, is critical. And this book is really about that. So this book also features, it's about activists. You know, all the books that I, I read, I uh, analyze in this, in this text, um, feature novels and plays and at times poetry that it, it discusses, it, 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 it interrogates the activist lifestyle, uh, what it's like to be an activist in the modern context. And so you see the impact of not engaging in self-care in this book a great deal. And so a part of what this book is about is creating a new theory, but also I'm, I'm intrigued by creating what I would call personal everyday theories, right? A thing to help us negotiate uh, life itself, which can be very complicated. So one theory that is that way is called uh, productive through joy. So using joy itself as a technology 
to help us uh, negotiate the world that is very complex uh, and very challenging. Because joy is very energizing. When you're feeling good, you want to go, you want to work, you want to create things, you want to start a business, you want to sing a song, you want to hop on your, your saxophone, you want to go do something. Um, and what if joy can be replicated? If it isn't tethered to some joyful thing happening to you, what if you could find a creative way, an intentional way to replicate joy and then use that joy to do good on the planet? It is possible, I think, to replicate joy and be intentional. You know, we, we, have, we have many modalities. We can use meditation, we can uh, create art, we can do art, we can, uh, we can do yoga, we can do many things. We can run. I, I'm arguing in the book, and also my own personal life, that we can also find creative ways to do this so we can be more activated and more conscious about being better activists as a part of this whole self-care paradigm. But in contradistinction, when you're feeling down or sad, or at times, for some of us, we have a chemical imbalance that we are depressed. And in those times, as we know, I'm sure in a room this large, at times it's hard to even get out of bed. I've had that experience. I've been I mean, having a lot of things to do on my plate. So I've got a big responsibility oftentimes, to be honest. And I couldn't even get out of bed, work be damned. I was like, I, I can't get up. So today, nothing's getting done. Nothing, which is not good in my life. Trust me, I have a lot of things on my plate. I, Covers up, that was it. That could be two days where nothing is done, which is a problem in my life, that's for sure. But, you know, I was down. You know? Life hit me too hard. I couldn't deal with it. It was like, whoop. Man, you know? And so I, I know both of those extremes super well. And so it, it makes sense then, if I can find a creative way to replicate those moments of joy and get those in my life every day and make joy a part of my life, and do that hard work, that daily yoga, that daily meditation, that daily deep breathing, that daily running, whatever it is I need to do, or you need to do, to make that intentional. Why? Because when you do that, you also get your mind off yourself. In times of struggle, helping other people is so important. It's so important, guys. You'll feel better, but you'll also allow someone else to benefit from your struggle. From a place of struggle in your own life, you can make someone else struggle less. That is powerful and profound, and it makes us more connected as a human family. That's just critical work, I think, for activists across the board everywhere. Joy also gives you um, a chance to make change, because you have more energy uh, to make change. When, I, when I'm sad and depressed, I am not thinking about change, right? I am thinking about Krispy Kreme donuts as we know, all right? And so, again, I, I'm sure people in this room would like to in some way make some change in their neighborhood or in their life or on the planet or in the federal government, if you get my drift. So who would like, by a show of hands, who would like to make, just show, just by a show of hands, some change on the earth? Anyone? A few of us, right. And so, if you don't mind, I know it's a little awkward here, but could you just say what you like to do to change? Like, just one thing. Like, not a speech. I know it's a little weird, you know. But what would you like to change either in your, on the planet, in your neighborhood, in your life? Who's feeling bold right now? Like a grown woman right now, you know? Who's, who's feeling that right now? Like a grown man. I'll go first. I, 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 would like to ch I, I would like to see mindfulness training, meditation, in urban schools where black and brown kids would go around the country, like to raise money, whatever, but five, six, seven-year-olds to be able to start meditating then, because it is so rough in urban neighborhoods, guys. It is like a war. That's my experience of being raised in that, but also seeing lots of it. It's rough, and kids are being decimated for life, because many of us, as we know, are walking around, if we're adults, even my professional colleagues, like wounded children. Our, our childhood still defines our adult life, even today. Our relationships, our professional engagement, based upon some hurt when we were seven, eight, nine, ten years old, some trauma, some violation. Because in our country, we, we do a very poor job at protecting our children. And I am sure in a room this large, we know of that which I speak. We don't protect our kids. Those kids are violated, and they become adults, and they never fully recover. And we're like the walking wounded as grown people. 
And that is a major problem. So for me, I would love to see children who are young, five, six, seven, eight years old, have a chance to learn about meditation, about self-care at an early age. Because joy gives you the power to change, and change is difficult, especially changing yourself. That is for sure. And so, ultimately, it's about theory and practice. So this book is a book about the theory, a literary theory, but it's also a book about praxis, right? It, it really lays out a, a paradigm for how activists in the real world can learn from good examples of activists in these narrative works, in these made-up books. Now imagine this. So as we know now, we have a driverless car. If you know science fiction, you know that in the early days of science fiction, we imagined in, in, in these books cars that drove themselves. Uh, we imagined in science fiction the cell phone. We imagined uh, in science fiction going to the moon, for example. And so I'm arguing that if, if a novel or a play can be an example of effective a activism that's democratic, that's non-misogynistic, that uh, embraces egalitarian principles and works, can those fictitious examples of activism influence, train, inspire activists in the real world to do a better job at not being oppressive as they go about the work of being activists? And I'm, and I'm arguing that yes, those books can, and yes, we can. Theory, praxis. And I, I, mentioned, I mentioned earlier a place called the world stage as an example, and I'll close here with this brief story about the world stage, which is a real place. It's a jazz venue and literature venue in, in LA's Crenshaw District. We have seven days of programming. We have a vocal workshop, a drum workshop. There's a children's uh, uh, orchestra. We have a young adult uh, orchestra. We have a, a writing workshop. It's a really interesting place, and it's right in the middle of LA's black and brown community off Crenshaw Boulevard. Buy Krispy Kreme donuts, which is not good. Um, that's the only problem with it, it's too close to Krispy Kreme. And so I helped to really make this organization. I was, I was in grad school at the time at UCLA, yes. And it was, you know, was post-LA riots, it was, it was a tough time in LA. There was a lot of crack happening in the neighborhood and a lot of violence. And off Crenshaw, you know, people were living kind of in fear. I mean, it was pretty rough. Folks wouldn't go outside. We had a bunch of drive-bys happening pretty much every day. And I was thinking as a young activist, what can I do to help? You know, I, I like literature, I like people. I thought, I, I will help to revive a, a writing workshop in a black neighborhood. So I found this place and talked to people who owned the actual building, got involved, and I, I kind of re-began this writing workshop uh, using my mentor, June Jordan's kind of formula. The issue was that it was in the middle of kind of a war zone. So on that corner where, where we're located, there were guys selling crack. I mean, it was this whole thing. So we had to, we organized some of our poets and drummers, and we go every Friday night for like a month before we, we actually opened, and we would do poetry and play drums to the guys selling crack. It's a true story. We call it Gorilla Poetry Live, G-U-E, Gorilla. And the guys were like, who are you? They would come up to us, hey, man, we're poets, man. We just want to let you say hi. And, uh, and ask you not to attack the people who are going to be coming to our workshop. And they would laugh and we'd do poetry, you know. We, so after a month of going every Friday, they kind of embraced us and let us do our poetry outside. We, we opened the following uh, Wednesday. And we began to have this writing workshop in the hood. And those guys who we, used to do, uh, who we did poetry for began to come to the workshop. It's got a little chill just now. And began to write poems about selling crack on the corner. Think about that. About trying to be in love when you're selling drugs in LA. And these very, very powerful narratives begin to emerge out of this writing workshop. And the idea was to have diverse peoples populate the workshop. So we had professors. We had folks who were like me who were students uh, at the time in grad school. We had sex workers. We had crack dealers. We had people who were crack addicts. We had, we had the black and brown community coming. And in this poetry workshop, because it was a workshop and it was about excellence, we helped, we would discuss the issues that were actually involved in the poetry, you know, the drug use, the, the police brutality and whatnot. And so from this workshop, 
folks begin to talk to each other, right, across class, orientation, gender, in such a powerful way, while making and writing super, super impressive poetry. So to make a very long story in right now, from that workshop, we had extraordinary success. There were many profiles on in the Washington Post, the LA Times, there were documentaries about the workshop, and we were getting published. New York Times bestsellers, uh, Janone Adams, uh, uh, D. Knowledge, who had a book uh, on, on, on Penguin Putnam. He, he got signed by Quincy Jones' uh, label. He had an album come out with Quincy Jones. My own book was a New York Times bestseller. I was on Oprah. All these major things happened out of a workshop designed to get people to talk amidst the LA violence and madness that black LA can be sometimes. Because as artists, we have to find ways to put our action, our work, our words, our art into action to be actants where we are. Even when things are difficult, even when things are bad. So what can words do? What can literature do? It can change a neighborhood. And in that context, it can also change those who change the neighborhood. Thank you.